so um, all of you have been doing a wonderful job uh, uh, service these uh, past uh, 19 or so weeks uh, discussing a chapter summarizing it and resulting in a um, lot of wonderful discussion i personally enjoyed it uh, immensely so i know i have big shoes to fill and i'm going to i'm going to try my best uh, forgive me for all the shortcomings uh, we'll uh, we'll summarize the first canto 19 chapters uh, so i'll break it up into two parts uh, we'll do the first three chapters and we'll then we'll do the remaining 16 chapters and the reason is that there's a slight uh, difference in the in, in the way uh, uh, the theme of the of these two sections of the ca of the canto uh, the first canto is kind of divided into the philosophical basis and the second part is uh, is describing the the personalities involved so one is more philosophical and the second is more um, for the lack of a better word it's more social it uh, it makes one familiar with the uh, with the actual setting of the bhagavatam the speaker the hearer the <clears throat> the circumstances that led to the speaking of the uh, of the bhagavatam so, uh, so like I said, I'll discuss the three chapters, uh, and uh, after that, I'll take a pause. And if there's any discussion, we'll have it, and then I will speak the other, uh, the remaining chapters, and then take a longer pause, and we can have any discussion on the sixteen chapters or the or the nineteen chapters. <clears throat> so, essentially, the first canto of the Bhagavatam. The, the first canto of the Bhagavatam is essentially <clears throat> is there to, to arouse both um, interest and faith in the, in the reader. So it introduces us to, to key philosophical elements the the four b's uh, the the four b's which is uh, bhagwan krishna then uh, bhakti the process to attain him bhakta the person trying to attain and then bhagavatam itself and uh, we will see these four B's throughout the Bhagavatam and because the first three chapters are the philosophical perspective they, they will they will explain this uh, more so and then in addition in the in the from the fourth chapter onwards we'll see the prominent characters of the Bhagavatam being introduced as well as the circumstances so essentially the Bhagavatam is a series of nested conversations. The outermost conversation is happening between Srila Vyasadeva and us. And then he relays a conversation that's happening between Sutta Goswami and the sages of Naimisharanya that are headed by Shonakrishi. And then Sutta Goswami is relating a conversation that is happening between Sukadeva Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit. So in the first canto, the setting is explained. Uh, Sukadeva Goswami has yet not appeared. So it's essentially a conversation between, between Sutta Goswami and, and Shaunakadi. Towards the end of the canto, Sukadeva Goswami will make his appearance. So <clears throat> the first chapter of uh, the first canto, it begins with the invocation. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And then as per the Acharyas, the Bhagavatam expands from this invocation. And uh, putting it differently, we can also understand that this invocation contains the essence of the 
Bhagavatam. Um, three different ways that we can understand it. One, that Om represents that which is Brahman. Now, Brahman refers to that which is spirit. In this case, it is referring to Jiva or the Bhakta. Namo refers to the process of attaining the Lord, which is Bhakti. Bhagavate means unto the Lord, that which leads unto the Lord, which is Bhagavatam. And Vasudevaya is the son of Vasudev, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So we see that this invocation is presenting to us the four essential topics of the Bhagavatam. The Jiva, Krishna, the process to attain and Bhagavatam. It can also be understood as as Om, that which is, which is Brahman, Bhagavate. So Bhagavate is unto the Lord, that which leads unto the Lord, which is Paramatma. And Vasudev is Krishna Swayam Bhagavan, the son of Vasudev. Namo is obeisances. So essentially what it is saying is, let me offer obeisances to the personality of Godhead who is the basis of Brahman and Paramatma. And the third understanding of the invocation is that Om indicates indicates Sambandh. And it indicates Sambandh because it is indicating the spiritual nature of the Jiva. And Namo indicates Abhidai, which is the process, the process of Bhakti. And Bhagavate Vasudevaya is Prayoja. So, by understanding the relationship, the spiritual nature of the Jiva with the spiritual nature of the Lord, when one performs devotional service, one is delivered unto the Lord. So in this way the Acharyas explain that, that that the Bhagavatam is expanding from the from the invocation. And actually speaking, uh, Srila Vyasadev, right from the beginning, he establishes the supremacy of Krishna. So later on we will see that in the 6th chapter of the 1st canto, Vyasadeva is chastised by his Guru Narad Muni that uh, uh, you have written so many things in the Vedas but they are unfortunately misleading people away from Krishna in the name of religiosity. So now he is very careful. He doesn't want to make that mistake again. So right from the beginning, the very first utterance in the Bhagavatam is Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. That unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he specifically uses the word Vasudev to say that this is that person who is the son of Vasudev. So that there is no ambiguity. He does not use a more generic term that is sometimes applied. He specifically uses the term that this is for this is applied to, to Krishna. In the, in the first chapter, which is titled The Six Questions by the Sages of Nemesharanya, we see the first three verses talking about these three topics. So the first verse defines the absolute truth. The second verse glorifies the Bhagavatam and the third verse which is directed to the devotees, it invites them to read the Bhagavatam. 
So they are considered to be Mangalacharan or auspicious uh, invocation. So verse 1, it, it defines Sambandha, verse 2 Abhide and verse 3 defines Prayujan. So in the first verse, Krishna is established as the source of everything. So everything that, that 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 you see is Krishna, including including uh, Lord Brahma. He is also dependent on Krishna. And then the question, of course, comes: is that if everything is Krishna, then why don't people see Krishna? And that verse also answers answer the question that that the illusion through which one is not able to see Krishna is also coming from Krishna. So after having accepted the fact that everything is Krishna, the verse invites us to Satyam Param Timahi. So it invites us to meditate on Krishna. And because of the word Dhimai, the Bhagavatam is also considered to be a, a commentary on the Gayatri. So Dhimai appears in, in uh, the Om Bhurdhavasva. So it appears as one of the words in the Gayatri. And uh, from that one understands that the Bhagavatam is a commentary on Gayatri. And uh, Srila Vyasadeva also gives us the understanding that the Bhagavatam is a commentary on the Vedanta Sutras. So specifically by using the word Om, he is establishing the Bhagavatam to be a Vedic literature. Because Vedic mantras are generally preceded by the Pranav Om. Like Om Tad Vishnu Paramam Padam Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudeva yeah. So the, the Puranas, they don't generally have Om there. Because Om is what? It, it, is, it is the Pranav that connects one to the, to the Supreme. So Srila Vyasadeva deliberately starts with Om to say that what that is following, the 18,000 verses that are following, this Om is there in front of each of the verses. The understanding is giving is that this is a this is a Vedic literature. Jiva Goswami comments elaborately on this in the Tattva Sandarbha. That uh, the Bhagavatam, it's the Pancham Veda, the fifth Veda, non different from the Vedas, because the Vedas themselves say that the Bhagavatam is the is a or more like the Puranas are the Vedas, and the Bhagavatam is a Mahapuran. So verse one, it invites us to meditate on the Lord. The second verse in the Bhagavatam glorifies the actual religion or the practice of actual religion. It is Abhide. And it starts from where the Bhagavad Gita ends. So the Bhagavad Gita ended with Krishna saying Sarva Dharam Parutyaje Maam Ekam Sharnam Raj that abandon all varieties of religion and surrender unto me. The, Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavatam starts with Dhramma Pujata Kaita Vatra that completely religi rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. Now listen to the highest truth. So the Bhagavatam is meant for one who has already accepted the fact that surrendering to Krishna is the supreme goal of life. And after having accepted that fact, they are now ready to practice on the process of how to do that. So the Bhagavatam is now inviting them that now that you have understood that Saravdharam Paityaja, now Dharma Projita Kaita. Now bring give up all these all these religions and follow the Bhagavat Marg of the highest 
truth. The third verse in the first chapter, it, it is an invitation for everybody to taste the nectar of Bhagavatam. So we see Vyasadeva glorifying Srimad Bhagavatam and he is urging us to, to drink that nectar through our ears. These three verses uh, are, as I mentioned, Mangalacharan verses. They are compi- uh, uh, <coughs> compact, but they contain the essence of what will be appearing. So it, so, so it is said that uh, uh, the invocation unfolds into these three verses, which unfolds into the three chapters of the first canto which unfolds into the two cantors, which unfolds into the, into the entire Bhagavata. So, with, the, with, the, with varying levels of emphasis and details, the concepts are, are successively expanded. So, moving on, the narration of the Bhagavatam, it happens at the holy place of Naimasharanya. And we see the sages over there, they are congregated to perform a yagya for the benefit of mankind. And they realize that the highest benefit of the mankind is to partake in Bhagavad Katha. So we see them glorify Sutta Goswami and asking questions from him. So the six questions that the sages ask become the basis of the the uh, the first uh, three chapters of the Bhagavatam and because we have established that the three chapters actually unfold so we see these six questions being constantly addressed throughout the Bhagavatam so what are the six questions that the sages ask they, they ask that what is the highest good for mankind. Then they ask is that what is the essence of all the scriptures? The third question they ask is why did Krishna appear? The fourth they ask is what are the Purusha avatars? The fifth is what are the Leela avatars? And the sixth is what did religion take shelter in after the departure of Krishna. So these will be answered later on, but for this, because we are doing a summation, I'll, I'll share the answers with you and you'll of course see them unfold. So the first question, what was, what, what is the highest good is, is, is answered as follows that the highest good for mankind is to develop love of God through bhakti or to develop Krishna bhakti. That is the ultimate benefit. Then what is the essence of all the scriptures? The essence is devotional service. Why did Krishna appear? So he appeared to reclaim the people in the mode of goodness. Now this mode of goodness is not really the material mode of goodness. So this is Satvat. That uh, because uh, Krishna as Lord Vishnu is in, is in control of the mode of goodness. So this is those who follow the controller of the mode of goodness or Vaishnavas. So essentially it means that Krishna appeared to reclaim those who are practicing devotional service, Vaishnavas, who are following Vishnu. Fourth question is that, what are the Purushaptars? And this is answered by giving an explanation on the three Purushaptars, Karna Daksha Vishnu, Garbha Daksha Vishnu and Kshu Daksha Vishnu. Then what are the Leela Avtars? So this is explained elaborately in the third chapter and what did religion take shelter after the departure of Krishna 
perhaps the most important question and the answer is took shelter in Srimad Bhagavatam. So everything that one gained by the association of Krishna while he was present, one can gain by the association of Bhagavatam. So the first uh, <clears throat> two questions are for people in general. What is the highest goal to love God? What is the essence of scriptures, bhakti? And the last four questions are for devotees because they are specifically in the context of Krishna. Why did Krishna appear? His Purusha avatars, Leela avatars, his uh, literary incarnation. So <clears throat> that brings us to the end of the first chapter. So we continue to the second chapter which is titled Divinity and Divine Service. So in this chapter the process of the change of heart is described and it is illustrated in, in the fifth chapter when we see the change of heart of Vyasadeva in the association of Narutmani. So what is the change of heart? Is, is changing one's focus from material or not Krishna to Krishna. The, the chapter also lays the, uh, the foundation of how best to associate with Bhagavatam. So the, the famous verse, Shrinvatam Svakatha Krishna Punyashavana Kirtanam that uh, um, the, the, the best way to associate with the book Bhagavatam is with the, through the person Bhagavatam. So it prohibits the association of the Bhagavatam through the mental speculators or through those who are using it for entertainment purposes. But a person who is sharing the Bhagavatam must also be living the Bhagavatam. And the result is Nashta Prayeshu Bhadreshu Nityam Bhagavat Sivaya. That all that is troublesome in the heart is destroyed. So, divinity and divine service is predicated on taking shelter of these two Bhagavats. The book Bhagavat and the devotee Bhagavat. And, and we, we, we see that we see that demonstrated that the sages of Naimasharanya take shelter of Sutta Goswami. Parishit Maharaj takes shelter of Sukadev Goswami. Srila Vyasadev takes shelter of Narad Muni. And throughout the Bhagavatam, we see this process. Vedur takes shelter of Maitreya. Yudhishthira takes shelter of Narad. This, this strong mood of taking shelter of the Vaishnava. So the chapter also answers the question of the sages that now that Krishna has gone, where does one take shelter? And it, it basically equates the Bhagavatam in its potency to Krishna. That's why Bhagavatam is considered to be the literary incarnation of Krishna. So Sudha Goswami, he says that the Bhagavatam is as brilliant as the sun and after the departure of Krishna, it has come to, it has come to dissipate the dense darkness of ignorance in the, in the age of Kali. So in this chapter, we see the answer to the first question, what is the ultimate good for the people? One of the, one of the famous verses of the Bhagavatam, Savai Pumsha Paro Dharmo, Ito Bhakti Radhok Sajay, Ahito Ki Pratiyata, E Atma Suprasiddhati. So, this is the Paro Dharma, Yato Bhakti Radhok Sajay, that to develop a loving relationship, that is Ahito Ki Pratiyata, that is causeless and un and uninterrupted and performed joyfully 
and then it also answers the question of what is the essence of all the scriptures vasudeva bhagavati bhakti yoga prayojita janatyashu vairagyam gyanam chatad ahitukam so bhakti yoga prayojita that this is the essence of the scriptures that practice devotional service and so one may say that um, what about the other things that the that the scriptures say which is knowledge gyan which is renunciation vairagya so sutta goswami says janatyashu vairagyam gyanam chata dahitu that without you trying for it without you endeavoring separately for it just by the practice of vasudeva bhagavati that prayojan will be made that arrangement will be made that janatyashu vairagyam that renunciation will happen and knowledge will appear so the devotee is never short changed it's not that the devotee because they have taken the path of bhakti directly will not get the knowledge of the scriptures or will not be able to develop the renunciation so these are the things that come when you gradually go through the through the scriptures but so the promise is that everything will be obtained obtained automatically so along with explaining what is uh, what needs to be done sutta goswami also speaks in this chapter about what should not be done so he speaks about kaitav dharma so kaitav dharma is essentially religion for sense gratification and he says that that should be summarily rejected so he makes the point both ways what you should do is vasudeva bhagavati bhakti yoga prayojita sabai pumsha parodama this is what you should do and what you should not do is take shelter of religion for sense gratification now after explaining the path sutta goswami then in this chapter talks about the goal and here he speaks one of the paripa sutra or the defining verses of the bhagavatam 13 uh, uh, 1 to 11 avadanti tatva tatva vedas tattvam yaj gyanam advayam brahmeti parmateti bhagwan iti shabdayate that one realizes the lord in three forms brahmeti as brahman parmateti as parmatma and bhagwan as the personality of god and this is the companion verse to a verse that will appear in the third chapter ete cham sakala pumsha krishna stu bhagwan swayam where so here he says bhagwan iti shabdayate there he will say who is bhagwan ete cham sakala pumsha krishna stu bhagwan swayam so here he defines a position there he defines the person who is sitting in that position which is krishna stu that only krishna is is there um in the concluding uh, uh, section or the penultimate the pre concluding section uh, sutta goswami talks about the progression of bhakti so after having introduced the notion of bhakti he then he then gives us a a, a road map of how one progresses from initial shraddha some kind of faith to prema and uh, also describes is also described in the 5th and the 6th chapter so <clears throat> uh, he is giving us more insight into the nuances of bhakti that bhakti is it, it, it's it's a journey it starts from having some kind of faith and then from there it moves through the various stages until one has intense love so we see that how sutta goswami is uh, uh, very masterfully he is mapping out the journey for us the where we are where we need to be what the path is and then what are the milestones that we will see on the path at shraddha you will see this at sadhu sang you will see this bhajan kriya you will see this so he is he is 
in a precise way describing the science of devotion. And then finally in the concluding part, he speaks about the Purushottas. Because this is one of the questions the sage has asked. And um, the reason that, that the sages ask about the Purushottas, the Purushottas of Krishna are specifically in the context of uh, the material creation. So if you notice the opening verse of the Bhagavatam, it describes Krishna in relationship to the material world. That he creates, annihilates, maintains and annihilates. That he is, he is that on whom Brahma is resting. Now Krishna is more than that. Krishna is there in the spiritual world. He is, he is dancing with the gopis. He is playing tricks on his parents. But uh, uh, Sukhdev Goswami or Vyasadev, they don't speak that. Because we are not ready to listen to that. We are not ready to appreciate that. But because we are creatures of the material world, we can relate to the material world. So, 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 so Krishna is presented in the context of the material world. It's a valid connection. It's a part of his connection. And for us, it's the most important because that's where we are. Similarly, when the question of the Purushavtars are asked, it is through the Purushavtars that Krishna creates the material world. So that's why the Purushavtars are asked. And then the Leela Avtars are asked, which will come in the, in the next chapter. So this ends the second chapter. And we move on to the third chapter, which is Krishna is the source of all incarnations. So this is a discussion of the various Leela avatars. The purpose of this question is for us to understand the ongoing protection that Krishna offers us. So uh, in the second, chap second chapter, Krishna is presented as Vasudeva Paramgatim. That the purpose of life is to please Krishna. So one who belongs to the Varnashram, they please Krishna by their work. The Jnanis, they glorify Krishna by the knowledge. The Yogis, they meet Krishna in the heart through Astang. And the devotees, they develop love for Krishna. So how to practically achieve this? Sutta Goswami has spoken about Bhakti. Now Bhakti, when it is progressing through different stages, it requires sustenance. Because Shraddha is weak. So the sages have asked and Sutta Goswami speaks about the Leela avatars. That look, Krishna is coming again and again and again. He is coming to protect you. He performs these wonderful pastimes by which you can fix your meditation on him. So uh, the, the, the discussion of the Leela avatars is that one way or the other we develop faith in Krishna. We see him coming as Narsingadev. Oh, he is not discussed in the, in the, in the Leela avatar but other avatars, the Kurma avatar, the Matsya avatar, all these are, all these are, uh, are uh, no, I think Narsingadev is discussed, I am sorry. So all these avatars are discussed so that, so that we are, we are, we are, uh, we are st struck with awe and wonder that look, Krishna, Krishna does all that. We feel protected. That Krishna hasn't abandoned us. It's not that as Purush avatar he created the material universe and went into Yoga Nidra. But he is repeatedly coming again and again only for our benefit and then ultimately 
it also leads to the position understanding of the position of Krishna. So this is where the the main paribhasha sutra verse comes one three twenty eight that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. So when Krishna is being spoken about, then somebody can say, "What about Lord Ram? What about Lord Balram? What about Parshura? What about Narsingha Dev? What about Matsya?" And and that verse clarifies that confusion. Etecham sakala pumsha. That they are all, they are all expansions of Krishna. Krishna is to Bhagwan Swam. He is the basis of of all of these. Then. And and then uh, uh, <clears throat> and and then uh, uh, and then the position with respect to Indra is is, is mentioned that uh, uh, he is the protector of Indra. Why? Because the same point is extended to the demigods. That even the demigods are dependent. The Leela avatars are non different from Krishna, but they depend on he is the source of them, and he is also the protector of Indra, the king of demigods. So essentially, the the chapter and the verse, it clarifies the position of Krishna as the source of everything. So that brings us to the end of the first part of the sum, summation, the third chapter. I'll take a, a pause over here, see if there is any comments. They are same. They are similar. Okay. Okay. So then let me... So part of it is from the commentary by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and part of it uh, is basically realizations of other Vaishnavas. So, so, so some of this is Gopi Parandan Prabhu's realizations um, that, that are there which of course he is, he, is, uh, he is sharing the realizations of others I unfortunately don't know the, the source. But essentially, they are uh, uh, realized. They, they don't appear in in the Bhagavatam itself. Is it because Parishit Maharaj 
and all the December devotees or the sages, the Gyanis who are December, uh, with him. They were already at that level to understand directly the other matters that had been discussed by Shukhuisra. I mean, Shukhuisra was such a, I mean, there is no specific reason behind, I don't know, why those parts were not part of the Mekta tradition. So Jiva Goswami speaks about this in Bhagavad Sandarbha and he says that when Srila Vyasadev composed the Bhagavatam, he composed it right from Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya till the till the end. Now how did Vyas, how did Vyasadev uh, know that what's the conversation that is going to happen between Sutta Goswami and uh, the sages, between Parishat Maharaj and the sages? Because he is Trikalakya. So he knew ahead of time. And, and that is a sense in, uh, in a sense the, uh, the Bhagavatam. The, the second thing that you will notice is that every answer that Sutta Goswami gives will later on be given by Sukadev Goswami. So uh, from a from a chronological point of view, Sutta Goswami is sitting in Naimisharanya after the conversation between Parishit Maharaj and Sukhdev Goswami has already happened. So each and every answer that he gives is essentially a paraphrasing of the answers that will be or uh, that have been given by Sukhdev Goswami. So uh, there is no difference between the conversation that is happening between Sutta and the sages and between Maharaj Parikshit and uh, Sukhdev Goswami. Thank you. Okay. okay, so let's proceed to the second part of the first canto, which is uh, just probably a little uh, little easier because it's pastimes so we now come to the fourth chapter which is the appearance of Narad Muni and uh, <clears throat> the the, Narad, uh, the 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 chapter opens with uh, and the sages asking a set of questions to uh, Sutta Goswami. So essentially the Bhagavatam, the first canto, is an answer to ten questions. Six questions that are ans asked in the first chapter and four questions that are asked in the fourth chapter. So in the first three chapters, the, the theme of the uh, the potency of Bhagavatam, the relevance of Bhagavatam, the efficacy has been emphasized over and over again. So the sages are now curious to know about Bhagavatam. So they are like, tell us more about the Bhagavatam. So they say that, who wrote the Bhagavatam? So they are questioning, uh, they are asking about Srila Vyasadeva. Who spoke the Bhagavatam? They are asking about Sukhdev Goswami. Who was the Bhagavatam spoken to? So they are asking about Parishat Maharaj. What were the circumstances in which the Bhagavatam manifested? So they are asking about the scenario in which Bhagavatam appears. So these four questions about the author Vyasadeva, the speaker Sukhdev Goswami, the audience Parishat Maharaj and the circumstances in which it appears. Essentially the first three questions establish the disciplic succession. That from Vyasa it came to Sukade Goswami, from Sukade Goswami it comes to Parishat Maharaj and Sutta Goswami and then it goes further down. So it's establishing the pedigree that the Bhagavatam, because if somebody has to put their life on on, on, on a scripture, they need to be sure that it is coming from the right source. So this is establishing the parampara. That yes, 
this, the, the same Vyas who wrote all the scriptures is author of the Bhagavatam. And then the point that is made is that Srila Vyasadev, who is the literary incarnation, speaks to Sukadev Goswami, who is the Vairagya incarnation, who speaks to Parishad Maharaj, who is the emblem of Bhakti. So, so the Bhagavatam has been distilled with Gyan, Vairagya and Bhakti, or more appropriately condensed, primarily Bhakti, but Gyan and Vairagya. Srila Vyasadeva is the same author of Vedanta Sutras, one of the most difficult pieces of scriptures to understand. The renunciation of Sukadeva Goswami was famous. He didn't even wear any clothes. He was that renounced. And Maharaj Parishad was a Mahabhagwat. So, it has come through this, through this very exalted pedigree. Then, we see the, the, the focus turning to Srila Vyasadeva. That Vyasadeva first appears in a mood of dejection. That uh, uh, he is wondering that I have done my duties. That as the appointed Vyasa of the Mahayuga, I have compiled the Vedas. I have written the Vedanta Sutras. I have written the Puranas and the Itihas. But yet I am feeling morose. And as an exalted personality, he knows that the soul will be unhappy if it has not served the Lord properly. But he does not know how has he failed his duties. He is unable to discern. So that gets us to the fifth chapter. Narada's instructions on Srimad Bhagavatam for Vyasadeva. So as Vyas is contemplating about his own potential shortcomings, Narada Muni appears on his own accord. And as an expert devotee, he succinctly and accurately points out the reason for Vyasa's dejection. He says that you have not actually broadcast the sublime and spotless glories of the personality of Godhead. And then as a guru, he chastises. He says the philosophy that does not satisfy the transcendental senses of the Lord is considered as worthless. So can you imagine Srila Vyasadev, his life's effort of compiling the Vedas and then the Puranas and the Itihas and the Sutras, dividing it, teaching it. And Narad Muni comes and says that all that you have done is useless. But this also helps us to understand the role of a guru and the mood of a disciple. Even though Narad is criticizing the life efforts of Vyas, the glory of Vyas is that he accepts that criticism and inquires. Narad says that what you have done is verily condemned and quite unreasonable. So he is using harsh words to do what Vyas was doing as service to mankind. And he is saying essentially what you have done is that you have given people karam kant. In the name of religion, they will follow what you have told them without being able to establish a connection with Krishna. And this, he says, is worthy of being condemned. So, in order to give an impress on Vyasadeva the potency of bhakti, Narada uses himself as an example. And he relates the he relates his previous life where he was a he was the son of a of a maidservant and how he associated with the Bhakti Vedantas and even though he had no qualifications, he was he was born of low birth in the family of a Shudra. He did not have a father. He had no education, no qualification, just the 
just the causeless mercy of devotees. And what did the causeless mercy appear as? That they planted the seed of bhakti in his heart. And because of that, he has reached this exalted position. So the lessons we have from this chapter is that although one is qualified in Vedic knowledge and Vedanta Sutra, that is not sufficient to satisfy the soul. In fact, it will just do the opposite. Even following disciplinary woes or gaining knowledge is not going to help the soul. It's like somebody is thirsty and then you are giving the person salt water. Only bhakti gives ultimate relief and the good news is that it is easily performed. That takes us to the sixth chapter now which is conversation between Narada and Vyas which is a continuation by Narada based on your own inclination. Sometimes people say it's between me and Krishna and whatever I do is bhakti and uh, you ask somebody to chant one round or ten rounds or whatever and they'll say oh I'm chanting all the time but I don't need to chant on Jap Mala. So ultimately they are whimsical. But the point that is made here is that it has to be performed under a bona fide spiritual master and according to the instructions of the master. That was only the only qualification of Narad Muni. That after he was associating with them, he performed what he was told to do. And the potency of chanting the glories of the Lord is also enunciated over here. That's what the Bhakti Vedantas did. That's what Narad Muni said that when Krishna disappeared, he spent the rest of his life chanting the glories of Krishna and because of that he attained perfection. When he gave up his material body, at the same time he got a spiritual body because of his constant engagement in, in the chanting of Krishna's name. That gets us to the seventh chapter now. The son of Drona punished. So after Narad Muni leaves, Srila Vyasadeva deeply meditates on the instructions of Narad and he deeply meditates on the creation. And he sees, in his meditation, he sees Krishna. He sees the material energy of Krishna. He sees the jiva suffering under the material energy of Krishna. And he also sees the spiritual kingdom. And then he understands that what he did and what he could do. So with this, with, with, with this vision, he compiles the Bhagavatam. And after having compiled it, he teaches it to his son, Sukadev Goswami, not because he was his son, but because he was a suitable recipient of the Bhagavatam. And then the Bhagavatam is held in the hearts of Vyasadeva and Sukadev Goswami, awaiting the appearance of a qualified recipient. Now Sudha Goswami changes the focus. He speaks about, about Ashvatthama. And the change of focus is that having answered the questions about Vyasadeva and Sukadeva Goswami, Sukadeva Goswami appears very briefly over here. He'll appear more in the 19th chapter. Uh, but this is to the extent that, that the question is answered. He will, uh, he will now proceed to answer the question regarding Parishit Maharaj. So in order to speak about Parishit Maharaj, he, he rewinds and speaks. He speaks right from the, the time that Parishit Maharaj, the Parishit Maharaj's first encounter with Krishna while still in the womb of his mother. So, he brings the attention of the sages and our attention to Krishna driving the chariot of Arjuna. But this is after the battle of Mahabharat. So, Mahabharat has finished, the Pandavas have won. On the Kauravas side, uh, Duryodhana has been mortally wounded by Bhima, left for dead. 
only Ashvatthama, Kripa and Krithvarma survived. And then on the Pandavas side, those who had survived were in a camp. And Ashvatthama, in a, basically because he was upset that Dronacharya was killed, but also to please uh, uh, Duryodhan, he attacks the Pandavas camp at night and he massacres everybody. He kills the five sons of Draupadi. He kills her two brothers, Dishtadumna and Shikhandi. And he kills, he kills the other survivors also. So the Pandavas were not there in the camp at the time. So when they come, they find out about it and Arjuna is angry. So he promises to Draupadi that I will come back with the head of Ashwatthama. And when you take bath standing on his head, after that you perform the the, the funeral rites of your son. So that brings us to the end of the seventh chapter. That the, we see in here the trance of Vyasadev. The, the lesson there is that if you follow the instruction of your Guru, everything will become visible to you. So it's the same Srila Vyasadev. But Narad Muni asked him to meditate deeply on what is for the benefit and that's what he did. And now everything became revealed. The chapter contains the famous Atmaram verse. Atmanamas Chamunya, Nigrantapya, Urukrame. Glorifying Sukadev Goswami. And glorifying Bhagavatam also. The question that is asked is that why did Sukadev Goswami, who was already a liberated person, listen to the Bhagavatam? And the point that is made is that that even those who are liberated, they draw sustenance and pleasure from Krishna Katha, specifically Bhagavata. So it, it glorifies Sukadeva Goswami as an Atmaramas, as one who is fully self sufficient, and it glorifies Bhagavata, Krishna Katha. That even one as great as Sukadeva Goswami, he ran to take shelter of the Bhagavata. So, how great is the Bhagavata? And we also see Krishna's interaction with the devotees. That uh, we see a contrast between Ashwatthama and Arjun. The Ashwatthama is described as Ursharanam. He has no shelter. What is his shelter? His anger, his mind, his the modes. And because of that, he is always worried about about uh, or, or the mood that he is operating is Swapranan Yah Paraprane. So the mood that is operating upon so pranan, that for my life, para prane, I have to take another person's life. So this is the jungle mentality, eat or be eaten. And then in contrast to that we see we see Arjun's mood. That he is Karmani Matam Vasudevasya. That uh, simply by acting according to the desire of Krishna. He is always protected and glorified. And in the chapter we also see Krishna testing his devotees. So being under Krishna's protection does not mean that you that you kick off your shoes, put your feet up and then just relax and say, okay, Krishna, now protect me. But being under Krishna's protection means that you're actively doing what needs to be done. And Krishna is testing also. Krishna is testing Arjun. He says that you promised Dropadi you would kill. But still it's not good to kill a Brahman. It's not good to kill the son of your Guru. Especially since the Guru is dead. Now he is the representative of, of, of the Guru. And we see that Arjun passes his flying colors. So Krishna tests his devotees and they pass and then he glorifies them. So, the glory of Arjun is how intelligently he solved the dilemma of killing and not killing Ashwatthama at the same time. So, we come to the 8th chapter, the prayers of Queen Kunti. So, Arjun did not kill Ashwatthama, but he cut off his top knot and took out the money and left him in disgrace. So, Ashwatthama is still angry. And now he throws the Brahmastra at the womb of Uttra. So Parishad Maharaj is there in the womb of Uttra. 
his father and Abhimanyu has already been killed. So, in the 8th chapter we see Krishna entering into the womb of Uttara and personally protecting Maharaj Parikshit. So, this is the reason why Sutta Goswami was talking about the backstory because he wants to introduce Parishit Maharaj to us. That this is the person who within the womb had darshan of Krishna. This is the person who was attacked by the invincible Brahmastra. And the Brahmastra failed to kill him. So we are, we are getting a sense of the glories of the, 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 the person who spoke, the, who, who inquired about the Bhagavatam. And now we see the we see the rasas change in the eighth chapter. We see Krishna protecting Arjun in Sakyaras. We see him protecting Prakshad Maharaj in Shantaras. And now Queen Kunti approaches him. And we see the Vatsalya Ras prominent. Where Queen Kunti glorifies Krishna over and over again with very, very beautiful prayers. This is the first significant prayer in the Bhagavatam. And it is interesting to note that it is spoken by a woman. So many times they say that that woman is uh, weaker or spiritually weaker. But the Bhagavatam doesn't agree with that. The first prominent prayer that is spoken in the Bhagavatam, that is one of the most glorified prayers of the Bhagavatam, is spoken by a woman, by Srimati Kunti Devi. And even though in the prayer she says, that what do I know I am a woman, but she speaks some of the most philosophically deep points, subtle points. She glorifies Krishna as a Kinchan Gochar. Same mood of 1866 Bhagavad Gita, that one who has given up all shelters, for, for that person, Krishna is the shelter. And glorification of Kunti Devi. So, <clears throat> So we see the prayer of Kunti Devi establishing also what should prayers to the Lord be like. So she begins with the glorification of the Lord. Then she talks about uh, the, her own position with humility. Then she asks for benedictions. And she concludes by asking for forgiveness. So the Acharyas say this is how we must pray to Krishna. We glorify him. We, we take uh, cognizance of our own fallen position. We ask Krishna for what we want. And then we ask forgiveness from Krishna in case we are imposing on him. Now Krishna can do anything he wants but still our mood is that, that we are sorry. If this this is going to upset you, because ultimately we are still the product of the modes, and part of the forgiveness is also accepting the fact that whatever Krishna does is our is for our best. So there is a very elaborate section on, not in the Bhagavatam but in other scriptures about prayers and and uh, uh, different kinds of prayers, and. Uh, 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 for those who who, who read it, uh, they use the prayers of Kunti Devi as a as a template for a certain kind of prayer. Now moving on to the ninth chapter, which is the passing away of Bhishma Devi. So Kunti Devi asks Krishna to stay, but he has been away from Dwarka for a while. So he, 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 he indicates that he is going to Dwarka and Manaj Yudhishthir appears to him, uh, appears before him and completely dejected and morose because he has been contemplating all that has been done in order to make him the emperor. In very similar mood to Arjun's, that Arjun was before the war and now Yudhishthira has witnessed so much of killing, so much of carnage. 
and he's just unable to take on the role and krishna speaks to him but he is still not convinced and then one might say that krishna was able to convince arjun why wasn't he able to convince yudhishthir and the reason is because he wanted to glorify another of his devotee bishma dev so this is krishna's nature that he gives his devotee a higher position than himself he is making this point that i tried to convince yudhishthir and i failed so i am taking the help of bishma who has a higher position than me and of course krishna accompanies <coughs> many things at the same time he is uh, uh, <coughs> he is talking about uh, uh, he is reciprocating to the mood of bishma bishma is sitting over there meditating deeply on krishna he is not willing to give up his body without seeing krishna so krishna is reciprocating with that mood and then he goes along with the pandavas he asks the pandavas to dress opulently to put on their weapons and and their armor and their royal clothes now normally when you go to a dying person you don't dress like that but krishna wanted to assure bhishma that his beloved pandavas are now properly situated they have won the war and now they are the they are the kings and the princes so the ninth chapter is essentially the the prayers of bhishma dev and the instructions of bhishma dev so uh, bhishma's instruction to arjun are very summarily presented here but in the mahabharat they appear as part of the shanti parva it's one of the it, it is actually the longest parva and bhishma instructs arjun from uh, yudhishthir from many many perspectives uh, from uh, political to art of war etc and he does that as a service to krishna because he knows that krishna wants him to do and then he turns his attention to krishna and and he prays to krishna so uh, we see yet another rasa over here that bhishma is relating to krishna in in virya ras so what is the form of of krishna that is meditating on parthasarthi specifically when krishna he got off the chariot with a wheel rushing towards bhishma to kill him and he says that your body is covered with dust there are specks of blood on your body from the arrows that i have thrown at you and you are coming to me like a lion comes towards an elephant to kill it so may that lord be always there in my meditation and with this meditation bhishma gives up his body so the lessons we know is that if a devotee cannot go to the lord the lord will go to him so so when we we say that what happens if a devotee can't think of the lord at the time of death for some reason lord will make him think of him the lord will go to him bhishma couldn't go to krishna krishna went to bish we see krishna's eagerness to glorify his devotees we see krishna's intense affection for his devotees that he was he was willing to break his promise to protect arjun and then we see that how krishna is reciprocating that bhishma is looking at him in that in the virya ras and krishna is is reciprocating in the same mood so um we have i should have i am going a little slow uh okay so we still have nine chapters to go so the 10th and the 11th chapter are essentially krishna's exit from hastinapur and entry into dwarka and both the chapters basically describe the point that is being made more subtly is krishna's interaction with his devotees when he is exiting hastinapur the ladies of hastinapur they are looking at krishna's krishna's some as a son some some in a conjugal way and then when he enters into dwarka then we see the same mood that uh, 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 different personalities in dwarka 
to relate to, to Krishna in a different way, all the way from Shantaras, people who heard the conch, the sound of the conch of Krishna, and uh, uh, they became enlivened. To those who came and shook hands with Krishna in friendship, to those who came and gave blessings to Krishna in Vatsalya, and uh, to the wives of Krishna in Madhurya, Krishna perfectly reciprocates with all his devotees. So, uh, uh, Sutta Goswami has gone into a bit of a tangent because he's become absorbed in Krishna Katha. He was, he was talking about Krishna to, to show the relationship of Parishad Maharaj with Krishna. But speaking about Krishna is so intoxicating that he begins to, he begins to talk about Krishna. Krishna with with Bhishma Dev, Krishna with in Hastinapur and Dwarka and the sages are a little concerned that our questions may not be answered. So in the 12th chapter they bring the attention of Sutta Goswami back and they said what about what about Parishad Maharaj? And Sutta Goswami he then quickly comes back and he explains, he talks about the glories of Maharaj Parikshit. To, and to show that, that one who is a devotee is perfect everywhere. Maharaj Yudhishthira was, he is described as a perfect ruler. And he says specifically, because he was always meditating on Krishna. Then he speaks about the birth of Sukadeva Gos, of uh, Parikshit Maharaj. The birth ceremony, the astrologers who came, they make the predictions and uh, briefly speaks about Parishad Maharaj growing under the guardianship of Yudhishthir and himself reflecting the qualities of a Maha Bhagavat. So the lesson here is that wherever there is Krishna, there is good fortune and auspiciousness. We can see that in the qualities of Sukhde Goswami, we can see that in the rule of Maharaj Yudhishthir. And the other point that is made is that bhakti can start at any time. In case of Maharaj Parikshit, it starts in the womb. He's, uh, when the astrologers give him the name Parikshit, they say the reason he is called Parikshit is because he saw the personality of Godhead in the womb of his mother. And since then, he has been examining everything or he will examine everything to see the same personality. So Parishat means to examine. So, right from the womb, Maharaj Parishat was a devotee because of his association with Krishna. After the 12th chapter, the next three chapters are, are, uh, are about the exiting of prominent characters and the reason they are spoken here is to clear the stage for Maharaj Parikshit to appear. So right now the stage is as it was after the end of Mahabharata. The Pandavas are ruling, Dhritarashtra is there, Krishna is there, that's the stage. Now, in order for the, for the Bhagavatam to be spoken, in order for Maharaj Parikshit to become center stage, then these characters have to exit. So, chapter 13 is Dhritarash quits home. And we see that Vidur returns from a long, long pilgrimage. And uh, he has learned the science of the self from Maitreya Muni. And he speaks very heavily to Dhritarashtra and shaken by the by the words of the of Vidur, Dhritarashtra leaves home and Yudhishthir for a while is perturbed but then Narad comes and tells him that within a short time Dhritarashtra who is practicing Astang Yoga on the banks of the river Ganges will give up his body and the fire that he will create his wife Gandhari will will enter and Vidur will carry on with his pilgrimage. So the lesson here is that everybody needs a, needs a guru. 
So we, we that that point has been made over and over again. So here we see that Vidur acts as a guru for Dhritra. She is a younger brother, but because he is more advanced in spiritual realization, he he acts as a guru. And until Vidur comes, Dhritra has been leading a very miserable life. Externally he was living in opulence, but he was Vidur describes that you're getting old, you're going to die, and you're living like the pet dog of Bhima. So what kind of what 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 kind of a satisfaction are you getting? And the the duty of the guru is not to speak kind words just for the pleasure of the disciple or to speak soothing words. The word guru means heavy. It means one who cuts. And we see Vidur playing that role. We see Narad Muni playing that role. Very heavy on Shila Vyasadev. That everything that you have done is, is worthy of being condemned. And Vidur is speaking similarly heavy words. But for the benefit. The disciples who accept this chastisement, they get the ultimate benefit. And then we see Narad Muni also speaking heavy words to Yudhishthir. When Yudhishthir is perturbed that where has Dhritarash gone? Who will take care of him? He's blind. Then Nad Muni says that since when have you become the caretaker of Dhritarash? You Do you really think that you can protect Dhritarash? Are you taking the position of the personality of Godhead? And then Yudhishthira realizes his, his, uh, his mistake. And then he also becomes calm. The next chapter 14th is the disappearance of Krishna. So we see that Arjun has gone to Dwarka to see the welfare of Krishna and Yudhishthira is, is seeing a lot of ill omens and seeing all these these, these uh, bad omens he is concerned and then finally Arjun comes back and he confirms the suspicions of Yudhishthira that Krishna has left. Okay. Next verse, cha next chapter 15 is the, is the Pandavas retire timely. So we see over here that after Yudhishthira hears about the disappearance of Krishna and Yadavas and then Arjun shares that how he lost his power from being the foremost bowman, the foremost warrior, he was unable to protect the wives of Krishna from insignificant cowherds men. They were, they, were, they were people from the jungle. He is not able to pick the same Gandhi that struck fear in the hearts of his enemies. So hearing all, and then you, Arjun is so perturbed and then he remembers the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. And then he becomes pacified. And then all the Pandavas develop deep renunciation in their heart. And then they, they, they retire, they go away and ultimately they go back to Godhead. So the lesson here is that everybody is dependent on the Lord. All kinds of beauty or power or wealth, everything comes on the, from the Lord. And uh, till the Lord wants it, it's there. If he doesn't want it, it's not there. And the second lesson is the achintya nature of the pastimes of Krishna. So when people discuss about about uh, Krishna disappearing. Then they get confused. The Acharyas say that Krishna does his pastimes also to bewilder the atheists. So when the atheists hear that Krishna died because of the arrow shot by, uh, by uh, a hunter, they say, oh look, Krishna is a, is, is a person. But the lesson is that best to accept the understandings. The pastimes of Krishna is mysterious. But the Acharyas give us the understanding. Yeah. Chapter 16 is, is the, the focus is now Parishad Maharaj. So, so Krishna has gone, the Pandavas have gone, Dhritarashtra has gone, Bhishma has, has gone, Ashwatthama is more or less uh, disappeared. So Parishad Maharaj is now center stage. And the 16th chapter is how Parishad Maharaj receives the age of Kali. So Sutta Goswami fast forwards about, about two decades now. The Parishad Maharaj is now 
the emperor of the world and he's ruling the entire world just like his grandfather did, just like Maharaj Yudhishthir did. And everything is, is auspicious, but then he starts noticing discrepancies and understanding that this discrepancy needs to be corrected, he, he begins to travel. And there he realizes that, that Kali is entered. So he sees the personification of Kali beating a bull and he challenges Kali. So that gets us to the 17th chapter, Punishment and Reward of Kali. So Maharaj Parishad, when he sees this incident, he asks the bull that what is the cause of your distress? And he says that you must share it to me, with me, because then only I can give you relief from suffering. And as a king, it's my duty to protect dharma. So if somebody is suffering under my reign, I'm also going to bear the sinful reaction. So please tell me, what is the cause of your suffering? And dharma refuses to identify the cause of his suffering. Or at this point, it's the bull. He refuses to identify. Why? Because he says that the law of dharma is very complicated. It's very difficult for me to understand who is the cause and what is the effect. And, and because of that, it is not easy for me to prove who is, who is killing and who is being killed. And then he says that if I identify the perpetrator, then I will also begin to identify with the perpetrator. So the point is making is that if I think too much on somebody that, I, that may be the cause of my suffering, I will also develop a consciousness like him. And then finally he says that, that, with the exception of Krishna, everybody is dependent. So, how can one dependent person be the cause of suffering of another dependent person? So, Maharaj Parishit, when he hears these uh, very uh, elevated words, he understands that the bull is no other than dharma. And he quickly takes out his sword to kill Kali. And then Kali surrenders to him. Maharaj Parishit as a Kshatriya says, If you have surrendered to me, I will protect you. So being protected, Kali asks for a place to live in. And Maharaj Parishit gives him four places to live in. Wherever there is gambling, wherever there is animal slaughter, wherever there is prostitution, and wherever there is drinking of, of uh, wines or intoxicants, you can live there. So Kali said that under your rule, these do not happen anywhere. So you are essentially not giving me a place to live. So Maharaj Parishad gives him a fifth place that wherever there is gold that is hoarded. So that gets us to the 18th chapter of Maharaj Parishit cursed by a Brahman boy. So we see here Maharaj Parishit understanding that uh, gold could be a place of Kali. He uses gold to spread the Sankirtan movement, the preaching uh, movement. So this point is emphasized here to establish the context that what happens next is not the activity of a bewildered soul. Maharaj Parishit was never under the influence of Kali. And Maharaj Parishad himself was a perfect devotee. So that's why the chapter is, its preamble is glorification of Maharaj Parishad as a devotee. Because anybody else can, can become susceptible. But one who is serving the Lord is protected by the Lord. So the understanding is what happens next is by the, by, by the, by the will of the Lord. Just like Arjun was put under illusion, 
that same thing happens to Maharaj Parikshit so that the Bhagavatam can be spoken. So we see Maharaj Parikshit insulting Shamik Rishi and his son Shringi cursing Maharaj Parikshit to die in seven days. And the understanding also is that if under the rule of Maharaj Parikshit Kali had not entered, then how was Shringi contaminated as a, as a Brahman? The Acharyas say that the cursing of Maharaj Parishit by Shringi is the beginning of the age of Kali. But it is not included in the age of Kali. So the contamination of Shringi is also the desire of Krishna. And we understand that by because even though he committed this, this uh, horrendous act of uh, cursing for a very minor transgression a Mahabhagavat, he did not suffer any reactions from it. Firstly, because he was a child. Secondly, because Maharaj Parishya, that is said that Maharaj Parishya was competent to reverse the curse or to curse Shringi. But Maharaj Parishya, he never bears any ill will. So there is no so there is no Vaishnava Prad. Maharaj Parishya did not take offense to what Shringi did. And then most importantly we see that Shamik Rishi, the father of Shringi, praying to the Lord for forgiveness for his son. So he was actually protected by the prayers of another Vaishnava. So from that we understand that Shringi also was masterfully picked by the Lord to do a to do a certain duty, help in the pastime, but not suffer because of it. And that gets us to the to the last chapter, which is the appearance of Sukadev Goswami. So when Maharaj Parishad understands that he has seven days to live, then he gives up his kingdom, he he he, he crowns Jamjay as the emperor, and then he goes on the bank of the Ganges, fasting to with the resolve to fast for the remaining seven days. And the sages, they, they, they assemble there. They congratulate Maharaj Parikshit on his decision and they promise that we will stay with you till the, till the end. So Maharaj Parikshit, with the fortune of having the association of some of the most exalted personalities, he begins to ask them questions. What is the duty of a person? And what is the duty of a person who is about to die? And different, different sages give different answers based on karma or jnana or, or, or rastang. And then Sukadev Goswami enters. So this is the second description of Sukadev Goswami. That is completely renounced. He is Mahapurush just by his physiognomy, the, the, the structure of his, of, his, of his body. And he is highly respected when he enters with the exception of very few people like Vyas, his father, and Narad Muni, everybody enters, gets up on their feet to, to respect him. And they give him an elevated position. So this is the, this is the position of Sukhdev Goswami. And then Maharaj Parishit, he again asks, asks the question that, four, four things he says. He says, he says, Kartavyam, that what should I do? And he asks it in the context of four things, Shrotavyam, that, what should men hear? Chapamyam. What should they speak? Chant. Smartavyam. What should they remember? And Bhajaniyam. What, is, what should they worship? And because he had just heard so many contradictory views, he says Viprayama. That also tell me what they should not hear, what they should not speak about, what they should not remember. Because he didn't want to be presented with alternatives. You do this, you do this. So when something is defined both through positive and negative, then it is a definitive description. So this ends to the, brings us to the end of the 19th chapter. And here we again see the lessons that the shelter of a guru is very important. That Maharaj Parishit has been glorified as a Mahabhagavat. But he is taking shelter of another devotee. Because that is the only way to make advancement. And 
the point that is also made is that a devotee is always protected but the devotee never takes the protection for granted maharaj parikshit he did not say that oh, okay i'm i saw krishna in the womb i am his devotee i have good lineage so fine but we see him striving till the very last moments of his life to improve his spiritual position that is the nature of a devotee trying to continuously serve the lord even till the last moment of their life and the final point is made is that the passing of a devotee is always glorious we see so many exalted devotees pass away in the first canto because they are always protected now one still laments the fact that their association is no longer there but one does not become bewildered by it so that brings us to the end of the first canto i did go over time my apologies for that uh, so i'm going to stop over here see if somebody has any quick questions or comments Thank you. It's a good question. It's asked. Uh, it's it's asked uh, often. So, so the beauty of bhakti is that it is multifaceted. It is. It, there is not just one path within bhakti. So, Plan Maharaj says, "Shavana Kirtan, Asmarana Bandhan, Padaseva Nadas." So, so many ways in which one can can one can bring their mind to 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 Krishna. That if one cannot speak and hear. one can one can read one cannot speak and hear and read one can meditate one cannot even do that one can do some service so shila prabhupada in vrindavan he would see an old lady and uh, uh, every day morning she would go to yamuna get a bucket of water and for uh, the temple and shila prabhupada said that she is going back to god it so the disciples were surprised because you know they were of this mode you have to chant 16 rounds and you have to preach widely and this and that and the proper clarified that because she is doing the service that she can do to the best of her to to with utmost sincerity so ultimately the services that we do are just demonstration of our sincerity there is nothing that krishna lacks that that we can provide but what he lacks is our affection and sincerity so that's what that's what we we demonstrate there's always some way or the other by which we can we can uh, serve krishna if we have the sincerity and the reciprocation of krishna will be will be there that will enable us to to serve even more Okay, so if there are uh, so if there are no more questions, then we can end over here. I'll turn it over to Parishit Prabhu. He has a uh, he he has three hundred and fifty thousand years of purification to go through. So that's what he is doing now. 
he is he is going through purification for uh, for purifying himself of the acts that, uh, that 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 he did and then he'll become qualified to take the position of the next vyas Uh, it is, and uh, Ashwatthama is getting the role of uh, Vyasadeva, which is an exalted position. But there is, you know, we have hope to get a position even higher than Ashwatthama, which is go back to Krishna. Ashwatthama's position at the end of the day is still material. And even though he's Chiranjeevi, but Chiranjeevi means that eventually he will die, he just has a long life. But uh, it's it's... It's it's hope for us that uh, um, he he has three hundred and fifty thousand years to purify himself to get another material position. We have uh, we have a few years to purify ourselves to get a far superior position, which is to go back to the spiritual world. So we are much more ambitious than Ashwatthama in that way. Yes, thanks to Prabhupada, thanks to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We have the elevator. Thank you. So in Mahabharat, uh, the disciples of Srila Vyasadeva, they ask him very similar question. Uh, now, I'm not aware of Vyas being a Chiranjeevi, but uh, the position of Vyas is eternal. And uh, they ask him, who were you? What were? So he talks about his past and then he talks about his future also. And he says that uh, uh, because he is Trikalakya, he knows what's going to happen. He says that when I give up the post of Vyas to the next Vyas, I will become one of the Saptarishis. So he goes on to take the position of one of the Saptarishis. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you for the encouragement. Okay, Parishit Prabhu, over to you. Thank you, Prabhu. Uh, 